Hello and welcome. This is lecture 60. The series is based on my book, Manual of Fluid Electrolyte and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find the book at the link below. It's on Amazon. We are still on chapter eight, metabolic acidosis. We are going to discuss proximal renal tubular acidosis. In the last lecture, I provided a general overview of renal tubular acidosis. And when we say a renal tubular acidosis, we have to know this is a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. So the anion gap is normal and chloride is high, so it's hyperchloremic. And the origin is the renal tubule, like the name says. Now, it can be either hypokalemic or hyperkalemic. When it's hypokalemic, it's either proximal or type 2 or distal type 1. These type 1 and 2 uh, were named based on the uh, date of discovery. Proximal or type 2 RTA, you have loss of bicarbonate due to failure of the proximal tubule to reabsorb all bicarbonate. Here, we don't have issues with distal acidification. There is normal ammonium secretion, so urine anion gap is negative. With all other types of renal tubular acidosis, renal anion uh, urine anion gap is positive. I'm going to say that again. In all types of renal tubular acidosis, except for proximal RTA, urine anion gap is positive. Why? Because we have problems with distal acidification, meaning we have problems with ammonium excretion. So distal or type 1 RTA, we have a positive urine anion gap. Moreover, we have nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis. We have low urine citrate. Now, the other possibility is hyperkalemic RTA. Here we have Two possibilities, either voltage-dependent type or hyperkalemic distal RTA, or type 4 RTA, which is due to aldosterone deficiency or resistance. Here again, in both of these types, we have a positive urine anion gap due to problems with NH4 or ammonium excretion. Now, if we want to summarize proximal RTA, how we can proceed with workup. It is as follows. So first, we have what? Non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. That's great. We've established that. Then we've excluded other causes like diarrhea, laxative abuse. We have a negative urine anion gap. So chloride is more than the sum of sodium and potassium. Okay. If we give an acid load the patient can acidify their urine. They can drop their urine pH below 5.5 or below 5.3. This is not the case with distal RTA. With distal RTA, due to problems with ammonium, they cannot, they can never acidify their urine. Okay, now when you give them a sodium bicarbonate load, say through the IV, here how you make the diagnosis, you have a fractional excretion of bicarbonate over 10 to 15 percent, meaning they're wasting bicarbonate in the urine. If you measure the urine minus blood PCO2, it's over 20, which is normal. Okay, in distal RTA, it's below 20. So these are the characteristics of proximal RTA. So we have non anion gap metabolic acidosis, we have a negative urine anion gap, the patient can acidify their urine, they are wasting bicarbonate, the fraction excretion of bicarbonate is over 10 to 15 percent, urine minus blood PCO2 is over 20, we don't have nephrocalcinosis, we don't have problems with urine citrate, we don't have problems with kidney stones. So as we said, the proximal tubule reabsorbs 80 percent of filtered bicarbonate, now, in proximal RTA, the proximal tubule ability to reabsorb the bicarbonates is diminished, so we start to have bicarbonate wasting in the urine until we reach a new level. Usually, once you have a serum bicarbonate 16 or 18, the wasting stops, 
and you have a new threshold and now the proxim cubule will reabsorb the bicarbonate but the serum bicarbonate is going to be at that level. Now when you calculate the fraction excretion of bicarbonate it's above 10 to 15 percent like we said and in order to to do that you need urine bicarbonate divided by serum and uh, obtaining urine and uh, serum creatinine is easy. The problem is obtaining urine bicarbonate. You have to collect the urine without letting any air goes into it. And unfortunately, most laboratories are unwilling to do this test uh, for us. Hypokalemia is a main feature of proximal RTA. You can have sometimes severe hypokalemia. Why? You have increased distilled delivery of uh, sodium, which goes with the, with the bicarbonate. Also, because of this uh, volume loss, you're activating the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, and you have hyperaldosteronism. Hyperaldosteronism will, con will contribute further to the hypokalemia. Therefore, in proximal RTA, the treatment is a replacement of both potassium and alkali, starting with potassium, then alkali. Now, proximal RTA can be an isolated genetic disorder, and in that case, you have pure uh, bicarbonate wasting due to uh, genetic mutation. The names uh, are on the screen. Or it can be part of Fanconi syndrome. But all of you have heard of Fanconi syndrome. And with Fanconi syndrome, not only do you have wasting of bicarbonate, but you have wasting of glucose. A wasting of glucose or glucose in the urine is called glucosuria, and you can say glycosuria. Both are correct. Um, you have glucosuria without hyperglycemia, so you don't have diabetes. You have phosphaturia, phosphate in the urine, amino aciduria. This is not proteinuria. This is just amino acids. And fortunately, the lab will uh, uh, get the titer for those uh, of those for you if you want. And then uricosuria, which is uric acid. So this is uh, a, a total failure of the proximal tubule. So you have wasting of bicarb, glucose, phosphate, amino acids, and uric acid. Fanconi syndrome is very important, can be inherited, rare disorders, uh, cystinosis, tyrosinemia, galactosemia, hereditary fructose intolerance, low syndrome, and Wilson's disease. Or it can be, and that's more important, especially for the adult uh, nephrologist, uh, can be acquired, as in multiple myeloma. This is probably where you would actually see a case of uh, Fanconi and light chain deposition disease. Some medications, and uh, everything I put in red is very, very important, like tenofovir. Please remember that if you're taking a test. This is a medicine used for HIV, really, really associated with uh, Fanconi syndrome. Never forget tenofovir. Uh, Ifofosfamide, uh, streptozosin, and gentamicin all can cause Fanconi syndrome. Toxins, lead, cadmium, and mercury can result in Fanconi syndrome. Used to be uh, degraded tetracycline, but that formula is not uh, used. Recently, um, uh, myself and my mentor, Dr. Bastani, we described the first case of Fanconi syndrome due to the immune checkpoint inhibitor, nivolumab. Um, and uh, I'm going to provide the, a link in the description to our paper. Now, uh, patients with proximal RTA can acidify their urine, meaning their pH can be below 5.5. Remember, and especially if you're a nephrologist, please remember that, okay? Don't, don't embarrass yourself. If you have distal RTA, distal, by definition, the patient cannot acidify the urine. So for complete distal RTA, you cannot have a pH of 5, okay? Then that's not the diagnosis. That's for sure. I'm going to repeat that when we talk about distal RTA. So with proximal RTA, it's possible to acidify the urine, meaning the urine pH can be below 5.5. Now, once you give uh, bi uh, bicarbonate, your pH is going to increase because uh, when you give more bicarbonate, you're going to waste more bicarbonate. And uh, like I said, when you give bicarbonate, you worsen the hypokalemia because you have excretion of uh, uh, bicarbonate with sodium. So that drives uh, potassium out. So this is why you have to replace potassium uh, first. Now, uh, that's also a very important feature. Uh, one of the main differences between proximal and distal RTA, we talked about urine acidification, is nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis. That's never seen in proximal, while you can see it in distal. So when uh, on a test, when they give you an RTA picture and then they give you an image with nephrocalcinosis, this is not proximal. This is not type 4. This is definitely distal type 1 RTA. Okay, remember that. 
Now, one exception to the rule is topiramate, uh, uh, which is used for seizures, migraine, uh, uh, can induce proximal RTA and uh, can cause hypercalciuria, hypocitrituria, and kidney stones because uh, topiramate is a carbonic and hydrase inhibitor. The other one is escitazolamide. Okay, how do we treat uh, proximal RTA? You need to give potassium until the patient is potassium replete, and then you need to give alkali. The problem is because when you're giving bicarbonate, you're wasting more bicarbonate, you end up having to give a lot of alkali, 10 to 20 mil equivalents per kilo per day, which is a lot. And um, you have to replace the potassium, like I said. Thiazides can cause volume depletion and may enhance uh, uh, bicarbonate reabsorption by the proximal tubule. So uh, the best options are alkali that contain potassium. So this way you are replacing both and uh, not replacing them separately. Children should be treated aggressively. You have to normalize their serum bicarbonate. Otherwise, you are going to have short stature. You are going to have growth retardation. Adults maybe can be uh, treated to a bicarbonate of 18. This way, you limit the uh, amount of alkali you have to give. Let me give you an example. If you have a 60 kilogram adult who is requiring 10, just 10, not 20, 20 mil equivalent per kilo of alkali, this is 600 mil equivalents a day or 20 packets of polycitra potassium per day. It's really not easy to have people take uh, 20 packets. Uh, our dialysis patients having difficulty taking one packet of uh, Renvella a day. Um, so it's, it's really not easy. Now, here are some examples of alkali treatments for RTAs, not just uh, proximal, also for, for distal. If you want to give sodium bicarbonate tablets, remember that in 650 milligrams, you have about 8 mil equivalent. If the patient is willing to take baking soda, some of my patients find it disgusting and probably will throw it up, and some, they don't care. Baking soda, yeah, the regular baking soda is very cheap. It's everywhere, and each teaspoon has 60 mil equivalent, so, so this is almost like eight tablets, and they dissolve it in water or whatever drink, and they gulp it down. Um, if you want to give, and that, that'd be great, uh, bicarbonate or alkali with potassium, you have several options. Potassium bicarbonate or effergate, this is effervescent, so it's very acceptable. And um, we, we have different sizes. We have 10, 20, 25, or 50. Um, don't use that to treat metabolic alkalosis, by the way. I'll emphasize that uh, in uh, the lecture on metabolic alkalosis. But it's good for, for this purpose. You're giving potassium and bicarbonate. Uh, one of my favorites, and I put it in red, is potassium citrate. And it's available in 5, 10, and 15 mil equivalents. Uh, this is my go-to uh, tablets for patients with hypocitraturia. Uh, many patients form stones because of hypocitraturia. It's very well tolerated. The price may be expensive. Sometimes insurance uh, does not cover it, but it's a very good option. Um, you can give polycitra K, and this is a solution. Some pharmacists have it. Some don't have it. And I put um, how much it has, like 5 ml will give you 10 mil equivalents of potassium and 10 mil equivalents of bicarbonate. Um, you can give it in crystals as well. And the crystals 4.5 packet has a lot of potassium and bicarbonate, 30 mil equivalents each. You all have heard in med school of Scholl's solution. This has citric acid and sodium citrate. It's available as Citra 2, uh, which uh, uh, has uh, 500 milligrams of sodium citrate uh, per 5 ml. And uh, each ml uh, has... Uh, a one mil equivalent of sodium and is equivalent to one mil equivalent of uh, sodium bicarbonate. I am going to uh, end here. In the next lecture, we'll talk about distal RTA. Thank you.